LVMPD is investigating a murder-suicide scene that occurred at the City National Bank building in the Summerlin area. Officers were responding to the Prince Law offices on West Charleston. Shots were fired during a child custody deposition. The shooter unalived his son's ex-wife and her new husband and then unalived himself. Officers conducted a security sweep of the building to determine if there was any further threats. They evacuated the people left in the building to a conference room in the Red Rock Resort. LVMPD Sheriff Kevin McMahill stated in a press conference that there was no longer a threat to the community. Officers located the shooting Supex vehicle in the parking lot of the office building and conducted a search. It is unknown if anything was found to aid in the investigation. This is a developing story. Stay tuned to LasVegasLive.News for further details regarding this incident. And that discovery, the body of an infant girl along with a young child found on the 405 freeway overnight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colleen Williams. And I'm Annabelle Sedano. The NBC4 I team is now confirming both children are connected to a murder investigation in Woodland Hills and a deadly crash in Redondo Beach. NBC4's Alex Rozier joins us live from Culver City with more on the breaking details we have so far. Alex? Yeah, Colleen, when we arrived at the California Highway Patrol offices this morning, we were briefed about the baby who was found dead and the child who was injured on the 405 behind me. But by late this afternoon, police confirmed that there is a connection between this incident and two other overnight deaths. At 4.30 this morning, CHP responded to the 405 in Sentinella in Culver City after they received multiple 911 calls for a medical emergency involving two kids. One child was located in lanes and the other was on the right shoulder. Once the fire department arrived, they pronounced a five to six month old baby dead. They also rushed a seven to nine year old girl to the hospital with moderate injuries. At the moment, it is unknown how the injuries were caused. Witnesses have stated that a black sedan was on the scene at the time of the incident. If anyone has any further information, we urge you to call our crime unit. But a half hour after the incident on the 405, at 5 a.m., a driver in a black car traveling southbound on Pacific Coast Highway lost control and crashed into a tree in Redondo Beach. Paramedics responded and pronounced the driver dead. But then, a little more than two hours after the crash in Redondo, the Los Angeles Police Department responded to the Montecito Apartments in Woodland Hills, where they found one person killed. It's not known when that person was killed, but they were discovered at 7.40 a.m. So we now know the baby's death at 4.30 on the 405, the crash at 5 a.m. in Redondo, and the murder in Woodland Hills are all connected. But how? We'll find out soon. Now, as for the incident on the 405, the California Highway Patrol really needs the public's help here. If you have any information that may help investigators, you are asked to get in contact with CHP's crime unit. But certainly the biggest development in the last hour, the connection between what happened here on the 405, what happened in Redondo Beach, and what happened in Woodland Hills. We're going to be tracking this very closely and bringing you new details as we have it. But for now, reporting live in Culver City, I'm Alex Rozier. NBC4 News. Tonight, police scouring a park in nearby railroad tracks near 31st and Galena after finding body parts in the area Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 12 News, Matt Salemi over the scene early Monday morning. We're told that this is an area where human remains were found earlier over the weekend. It's a block away from where police found the car of missing 19-year-old Sade Carlina Robinson, burnt in an alley. Robinson has been missing since last Monday. Her family tells 12 News they also found her blanket in this area near the discovery of one of the body parts. We need y'all's support to help and find more evidence. Thanks to these people out here, we, we found a little bit more evidence, but we still don't know everything. Neighbors in the area are in shock. When I saw you guys, I said, uh-oh, did they find something else? And that's when you confirmed they did. Your reaction to the fact that they found more? Uh, it's unnerving. Uh, we all hope as a community that nobody's crazy enough to do something around right here. The gruesome weekend discoveries come after someone found a severed leg here in Warnamount Park in Cudahy last Tuesday. Milwaukee County Sheriff's deputies searched this home near 39th and Oklahoma Friday related to that case. They took a person of interest into custody. 12 News Investigates confirms that person is the homeowner. We are not naming him because he hasn't been charged. 
With more questions than answers, Robinson's family fears connecting the dots may reveal the worst. You have to prepare for the worst and pray for the best. And worst case scenario, Sade's not with us no more. And right now, I just want justice for the person that did this to her. James, the person of interest in the case of the leg discovery in Cudahy may be in court as early as tomorrow. And we've confirmed that through sources, Patrick, that that homeowner could be in court tomorrow near 39th in Oklahoma. Milwaukee County Sheriff's deputies say they're working closely with the Milwaukee Police Department, have not made the connection between Cudahy and this park here quite yet. Of course, they say they're working closely with Milwaukee Police, also asking anyone with credible information to call the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office and the Milwaukee County Police Department. That investigation continues. James Stratton reporting in Milwaukee tonight. All right, thank you, Ron. New details come to light today at a shooting at a Southfield Chipotle. The shooting left one employee shot in the knee and one man in handcuffs. Yep, uh, police released new surveillance and body camera footage showing exactly what happened. Let's bring in Will Jones, who's in the newsroom to break this down. Will, it, it's, uh, this all started, believe it or not, over guacamole, apparently. Devin and Karen, it's hard to understand how a dispute over a serving of guacamole could escalate into a shooting, but that's exactly what happened. And keep in mind that this Chipotle is right across the street from the Southfield Police Department. Southfield Police say last Friday evening, 32-year-old Aaron Brown of Detroit called a Chipotle female employee a derogatory name. They say he was upset about his serving of guacamole. Brown is then seen on surveillance video going around the counter, packing up his order along with some guacamole. When a worker tries to stop him, Brown attacks him. Shortly after that, police say Brown fires a shot, hitting a 21-year-old employee in the knee. The occupants inside of the Chipotle uh, began to run for safety, exit the restaurant, while Mr. Brown calmly collected his food and left. Police say Brown drove off with his wife from this Chipotle on Evergreen. Brown was taken into custody not long after the shooting. We add to the fact, this happened right across the street from the police station. So what's the nerve of that? And you think you're going to get away with it? Police say Brown had a valid permit for the gun. He's now charged with assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than murder, weapons, discharge in or at a building causing injury and possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony. That's why we have to take these gun crimes very serious uh, in this country, because these individuals are getting a hold of these weapons. They're not understanding the importance of knowing when you use a weapon. Use a weapon for a life-threatening encounter. This certainly was not a life-threatening encounter. As you saw in the video inside that Chipotle, the restaurant was pretty busy at the time. Southfield Police Chief Elvin Barron emphasized that others could have easily been hurt in this shooting. Fortunately, there were no other injuries. Karen? Well, how is the victim doing tonight? Police say that bullet struck the worker in the knee, Karen, and exited out of his calf. There is concern about possible long-term damage to his knee, but yeah. everyone is hoping that that won't be the case. I sure hope so. All right. Thank you, Will. And a vigil tonight for a woman and her two children shot and killed and then their home set on fire. The suspect, the woman's husband and children's father. Ken's Five's Mike Jimenez spoke with the victim's brother tonight. Blanca Pescador's family says they wanted tonight's vigil to be a celebration of Blanca's and the children's lives and of happier times. Yeah, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Jose Madrid, brother of Blanca Pescador and uncle to Leslie and Freddie Jr. made his way from Odessa to El Paso, where the family is originally from. Then he traveled to San Antonio, where they held a vigil Saturday in front of Blanca's home. It was the first time Jose had seen her house after the fire. It shocked me because basically, mentally, I was not prepared for it. On March 8th at 10.45 in the morning, firefighters were called out to the home after it became fully engulfed in flames. Soon after, arson investigators took control because it looked like the fire was intentionally set. Inside the home, the bodies of Blanca, her husband Alfredo Pescador, and their two children, Leslie, 19 years old, and Freddie Jr., 14, were found. The medical examiner would determine they all had been shot and killed before the home was set on fire. Police say it was a murder-suicide at the hands of Alfredo. Right now, she's in a better place, up in heaven, with her, with her children. Jose says Blanca and her family were humble and always willing to help anyone in need. Today would have been Blanca's 41st birthday. At today's vigil, Jose was surrounded by neighbors and friends who he says are now part of his family. Very beautiful because the family grew. 
family grew, he could feel the love, the appreciation, the tears, the joy. Comforted by all the love and support today, Jose wants everyone to remember the happier times they shared with Blanca, Leslie, and Freddie Jr., not the tragedy left behind. I would love for the people who knew them to remember something special on their lives that they had shared. Uh, a laughter, a talk, a walk, uh, spending time. Jose says he and Blanca were close and their loss has broken him. He says the drive home will be tough, but he is trying to move on, taking it one step at a time as he tries to heal. I gotta find a way so I can continue with trying to accept this tragic loss in my life. Mike Menes, Kins 5. And teachers, parents, and students of the Polk County School District are stunned by the brutal death of Espinoza's mother, a second grade teacher at Ben Hill Griffin Elementary School. News Channel 8's George MacArthur joins us live in Frostproof from where his mother worked. You spoke to other teachers and they're all stunned by this, right, Georgia? That's right, Stacy. The staff here still trying to come to terms with what happened. Teachers say Elvia Espinoza was the perfect role model for her students. And in fact, the teacher that I spoke with today says Elvia always dreamed of being an educator. Thank you for being a light to the people in our community. Thank you for being a light to your kids. I know today was probably the hardest day uh, or finding out from their parents. A somber reflection of a devastating loss. Elvia Espinoza, a second grade teacher at Ben Hill Griffin, died after deputies say her son stabbed her. She was a student in school and so um, she came into um, working with me and trying to motivate her to get graduated. She was very motivated already. Nancy DeMarco, who works at Frostproof Middle Senior High School, taught Elvia. She says Elvia always had a passion for education. Had a zest for life, and, and that's what I remember about her. Her big smile. And my mom and dad for sacrificing so much and for being the perfect role model. Her son, Emmanuel Espinoza, was once a celebrated valedictorian in Frostproof. Elvia's colleagues say this was a turn no one saw coming. She always had a smile on her face. She always had a greeting for you. She was always going to brag on how well her kids were doing, her student, you know, her children. The Polk County School District issued a statement calling this a devastating loss for a greatly loved teacher and colleague. I am told there were grief counselors here on campus for staff and students who needed one. Reporting live in Polk County, Georgia MacArthur, 8 on your side. Still to come.